Welcome to Global Chats. My name is Sue Kirby. I'm the coordinator of Field Studies and Study Abroad. I'm here today with Dr. Shamali Ajgonkar. She is a professor of biology and environmental science at College of DuPage. She's been teaching there for over 25 years. Um, Shamali is here to talk to us about COVID-19 and the effects um, in the environment. But um, on campus, she's very active in the Food Security Initiative which is a program that also works with students in the fuel pantry and the fuel garden. Um, and she's also co-chair of the COD Sustainability Film Series, which shows films on um, environmental issues uh, every year. And Shamali has taught many courses at COD uh, through the Field Studies Department using experiential learning, um, as well as service learning and learning communities, which uh, combine two classes in different disciplines to teach around a single subject. So welcome, Shamali. Thank you. So today we're gonna to talk about COVID-19 and the environment. And I think um, we all need a little bit of happiness in our life right now. So I'd like to start on the topics of what has been a positive outcome of this. Uh, if you remember back in March and April, uh, we saw a lot of pictures of cities, large cities around the world like um, Delhi and Los Angeles that were typically really polluted and we saw pictures of how their air became much cleaner um, and how wildlife was returning to settings that had been overtaken by humans. So talk to me a little bit about what we can find as a positive in COVID-19. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, so I think that uh, certainly while people have been sheltering in space, uh, in place and staying indoors um, and, um, and social distancing, you are correct, you know, uh, air quality in, uh, in various parts of the world did get better uh, during um, when we were in sort of full lockdown mode. Um, and uh, the oceans got quieter as well because there was less um, sort of transatlantic ocean traffic, you know, no cruise ships uh, and that kind of thing. Um, there was also wildlife was showing up in places which ordinarily would have been packed with tourists visiting national parks. Um, and, um, and then also because of all these changes in transportation, there has been some noted decline in poaching activities, mm. either because poachers have not been able to get access to the parks or because the sort of the markets uh, to transport these things have a sort of, um, again, and I'm not saying for all animals, but certainly this was at least one, uh, one example that I saw was decline of poaching of rhinos um, in South Africa. So, um, so certainly um, animals have been um, showing up in lots of places. I certainly see evidence of that in my own yard. Uh, you know, just this morning I saw a, a woodchuck and of course there are the rabbits, there's raccoons. Um, I saw a fox the other day, you know, I, and whether that's because I'm staying at home and I'm seeing these things or whether they are just much more prevalent, it's, it's sort of hard to say, but I would certainly say that animals are doing just fine uh, with all of us sort of trying to stay inside. Yeah, I see um, everybody and their brother has a bird feeder now and is watching the birds from their house. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I would say that there are, those are certainly some, um, um, some general positives, but you know, as we know in the environment, you know, there's always a flip side to everything. And, um, and so one of the things in particular that I would like to talk about that is sort of much more global in nature is this sort of concept of what we call Earth Overshoot. And I have a slide that you provided me that I will share now. Okay, perfect. Tell us about this, Shamali. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with a little bit of, uh, of uh, a background to explain what Overshoot is. And it basically uh, works on the idea that the Earth has a certain uh, amount of what we would call biocapacity, which is the ability for the planet to regenerate resources that we use on a daily basis. And then measured against that biocapacity is the notion of what we call an ecological footprint, which is the demands that we as humans make on the planet. And so the way you sort of look at those two measures collectively is you look at what the value capacity is, which is what the planet has to offer, if you will. And then you say, what are our demands on the planet? And so 
under ideal circumstances, we live on one earth and our demand should not exceed the one earth. But if you look at this graphic at the top, it shows that in the 1970s, um, that was about the last time that we sort of, our resource consumption was the equivalent of one earth. As it stands today, we need about 1.6 earths to support us. Right now you could say, well, where, there's not 0.6 of an earth, so where does that come from? And so that's where that concept of overshoot comes in because the overshoot is really just a measure of how much we are overshooting that available biocapacity. Okay. Um, and so in an ideal situation, we would be uh, going through the whole year before we hit that or overshoot. It would be essentially okay. the end of December. Correct. Yes. And right so now. First, yeah. So the overshoot day for 2020 should be January 1st of 2021. Yes. Okay. Got it. But by current calculations, we are going to hit overshoot day on August 22nd of 2020. And you okay. can see on this graph, 2020, that, that little drop we have is Correct. because of the pandemic? It's because of the pandemic. Correct. So we have been on trend where Earth overshoot day has been moving uh, sort of up into the calendar every by three days every year. Mm -hmm. So last year, it was June uh, 29th. Okay. And so if everything had gone as it was the year before, then we might have been at June 25th or something like that for this year. But instead we've made almost one whole month gain, uh, in o overshoot day coming August 22nd. Now it's still not January 1st of 2021, mm -hmm. but it is a definitely an improvement. And that improvement, which means that the demand on biocapacity um, has been less because what effectively is going to happen after August 22nd is we are borrowing from 2021. We're so borrowing from like, the future. Yeah. Right. We're borrowing from the future. So you can continue to do that for a little while, mm -hmm. right? It's sort of like borrowing like credit, right? So mm -hmm. you can continue to do that for a little while after which you cannot. Right. And this, and so, this so graphic one, shows that it was the carbon footprint and the forest products footprint that really had the largest drop. Correct. Correct. So you can see that by their calculations, um, uh, they are saying that there was about a 14 and a half percent um, sort of decline um, in our in our carbon emissions, uh, which primarily came from people sheltering at home and therefore, you know, you know, air transport stopped, um, you know, uh, car transport stopped, even public transport stopped. Mm -hmm. And so um, and then there was also the decline in industrial output because so many businesses and all things were closed. And so that effectively meant that about, there was about a 14 and a half percent decline in carbon emissions. Um, and then similarly, there was about an eight and a half percent almost um, decline in uh, the forest products footprint. So this is including things that we get from forests. Now you would say, well, you know, there was a lot of paper sold because people were hoarding paper, but there's a lot more that comes out of forests than just paper. And so that eight and a half percent almost decline in forest products reflects that. And so those two measures are the primary measures for this improvement. Okay. Now this is what, this is the direction we want to go in, but the pandemic is really not the way that we want to get ourselves there. Right, of course. It's just going to be a little blip in an improvement that once we get Correct. back to our ways, might not... Might not happen. have staying power. But what this, I think, the positive story, because you were asking for a positive story, right? The positive story is that we were forced into this, but it also shows that this is possible, mm -hmm. right? And so I think we have to think about what are the things that we could change to make sure that we sort of stay on this path? So are there ways that we could cut the carbon footprint? Are there ways we can cut the forest products footprint, even as we go back to whatever right. normal is going to look like? Right. And some of those things might be allowing people to work from home more so they don't use transportation as much. Correct. Cutting Correct. down on our travel or our um, long distance um, transportation of goods. Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay, absolutely. great. Yeah. So that's something that we could say was a positive out of this current pandemic. And unfortunately, there's probably a lot of negatives too. So what are the challenges that we're facing environmentally because of the pandemic? Um, what kind of things come to mind 
for that? Um, so I would say in terms of the, the challenges, um, there are, uh, there are um, many um, different kinds of challenges. You know, some are sort of more obvious and some are sort of less obvious. Um, so one of the things that are clearly more obvious is that we have um, probably seen declines in waste in some ways, but increases in waste in other ways. Right. So um, so there's a lot of talk about PPEs and all of that kind of stuff. And if those PPEs are effectively disposable, then that is a new source of waste that we not never even thought about in 2019. Yeah, we've seen pictures of of masks being left on the shores, uh, washing up on the shores. And, you know, everybody moved to order out food, which all involved styrofoam and plastic containers. Exactly. We've increased our production of of garbage and probably right. in a time where recycling wasn't the primary thought of people after the fact because right. of the right. risk of transmission of germs and yeah and people are probably even nervous about recycling things that they might ordinarily have because we have just so much concern and uncertainty about where this virus is harbored and you know should you touch that or should you not touch that or you know that kind of thing so certainly i would say you know, there has been a significant increase in waste, you know, um, plastic waste, um, paper waste, uh, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but I think the other sort of less told story about all of this is really the waste that's associated with food. With actual um, food. And, um, you know, in, in, and in some ways, that waste at our individual levels is probably getting less because you are probably more aware of things that are in your refrigerator and your pantry than you might otherwise be when you were not at home all the time, right? And you're not going to the grocery store as much. Yes, and you're avoiding going to the grocery store as much. So, you know, I for sure have found things in my pantry and things in my refrigerator, and I'm much more conscious about trying to plan meals because I want to cut the trips to the grocery store Mm -hmm. and therefore reduce that sort of food waste at home. But what I am talking about food waste is at the sort of more broader industrial level. Because can I, can with the share a screen with some info? Okay, great. Yes. Because with the shutdown in the restaurants and, uh, and in the shutdown in uh, the big, you know, like uh, school sent all the school shutdown, restaurant shutdown, and all of these uh, big uh, sort of uh, institutional facilities um, and commercial facilities, once they shut down, then what you what you heard probably on the news was uh, farmers talking about how they were, you know, dumping a milk or um, they had no markets to settle their onions or any other kinds of things to. Because when you have a restaurant, for example, uh, you you have a sort of uh, an egg that's laid by a chicken. And then it might take two days for that egg to get from that facility where it was laid to the restaurant where it is going to be cooked into somebody's breakfast. And so when the lockdowns were announced and those restaurants shut down, you know, nobody sort of said to the chickens, hey, you can stop laying eggs. <laughs> so, you know, so now we have all these eggs uh, and we really have nowhere to send, uh, you know, send them all of a sudden. But so and let so me that ask- is- where Let me ask a curi- comes from. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Let me ask a, curi- uh, a, a clarifying question, though. So, in theory, we were all still eating at home. So, what was the cause of this waste from when the, the eating shifted from restaurants and schools to home settings? Why was there a, a issue with the waste we're still eating? Right. So, that's a, that's a really, really good question. And partly it has to do with, uh, with the sort of what we call the food system. And, um, and basically, the reality is that our food system is designed for like really prime optimal efficiency. Um, and when it is designed for prime optimal efficiency, it's really thinking about where that food is needed, where it is coming from, and how it is going to be transported there. But it is not really super resilient. And so what that means is that when there is a shift something like a lockdown that changes uh, the necessary infrastructure, there's, it's not possible to make those sort of quick pivots. So farmers who are used to delivering milk to like schools or, um, or universities, you know, to the dorms, 
they have to have different kinds of packaging. And um, it's not the same kind of packaging that you and I purchase the milk in the grocery store in. Well, if they don't have access to that packaging, then the milk is there and then there's nowhere for that milk to go. So they're used to sending a truck, uh, a, a milk truck full of milk to a single location and they have no way to shift to create individual quarts Correct. and gallons. They don't Correct. have production. Correct. Or maybe, maybe not a whole truck of it, but maybe just bigger packaging than you and I would buy in a grocery store. Yeah. So it's a supply chain issue. It's a supply chain yeah. issue. The other, the other thing is that you could say, well, you know, why don't these farmers just donate to food pantries? Because clearly the other thing we've seen in the pandemic is that as people have lost jobs, mm -hmm. then um, there is not really that much, the, the, you know, there's been a higher increased demand on food pantries. Mm -hmm. And farmers have been sending their food where they could to the food pantries, uh, but uh, food pantries have a limit to refrigeration they have available. Mm -hmm. So if a farmer has like 30,000 eggs, <laughs> you know, I mean, like which food pantry has like, uh, you know, storage right. capacity for 30,000 eggs. So partly the problem is uh, it's a couple of things. It's, it's these changes in the system um, that, uh, which which is partly related to the packaging, you know, mm -hmm. and is partly related to the abilities to to kind of store the food right. so that we can get it out to people when when they need it and as they need it. So so and that's what I'm talking about when I say that you know our food system can be very highly efficient and it can work really well under some set of ideal conditions, but it doesn't really have very good built-in resiliency. Um, to, to pivot to another need that we have. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, and I think we've seen um, examples of small pivots. Restaurants who repackage their 500 pounds of flour into individual 10 pound bags for customers, but that really is just a small scale yes, uh, pivot and we need the yeah. entire industry to be able to pivot. Absolutely, yes. And so you, if, you, if you search for these stories, you're gonna find you know, a local, some local uh, person who connected a farmer with uh, food pantries in the area. So his, uh, because he, uh, he had all these eggs um, that he was gonna have to destroy. Um, and she was able to, you know, by using social media, able to find a source for them. Mm -hmm. um, some restaurants that when they shut down um, and did not need as much, they, they worked with their local farmers to establish like community supported agriculture. So they actually started to do sort of uh, uh, selling of the produce that the farmer might have bought to the restaurant, but then selling it to the customers who would have ordinarily come to eat at the restaurant. Yeah. So, you know, so, so both at the individual level and even at the restaurant level, um, um, and at even at the industrial level. So you probably heard of uh, a company sort of like um, Imperfect Fruit, Ugly Fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, you know, so there are companies like that that also sort of got involved. So they, um, I think there was a whole, um, I can't imagine how much it was, but there was like a whole sort of those cheese and cracker things that are served to you when you're oh. in a, in a plane <laughs> the baskets <laughs> yeah the, yeah yeah you know when you when you're when you're on a flight yeah. and I, I know many airlines don't serve things like that anymore but some of them have started to serve those things so those things were going to go to waste yeah because when when the plane stopped then there was no need for all of that cheese and so, and so a company uh, uh, like, like Imperfect Foods sort of got involved and was able to help to pivot to sort of have that cheese not go to waste. Right. So, but those are again, small things. What we need to think about is how can the system itself be made much more um, resilient, resilient, resilient. Um, okay. so that it can make these quick pivots when we find ourselves in these kind of crisis yeah. situations. So that really brings us to another place uh, that we were going next, where the COVID-19 pandemic um, parallels another aspect of environmental issues, and that's greenhouse gases. Um, so I have a slide here to share. And can you talk a little bit about the idea of the parallels between the pandemic and um, global warming? I'm sure. Um, there are many, many parallels between the uh, pandemic and sort of all of the issues that are related to climate change. Um, so um, 
uh, some uh, some are more sort of immediate because the same um, the same fossil fuels that are burnt that are uh, releasing the greenhouse gases that contribute to uh, global warming, which then contributes to climate change. Um, the burning of those fossil fuels also puts other kinds of air pollutants besides greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, like particulate pollution and so forth. And we have seen some pretty strong correlation between people who have been exposed to air pollution, particularly particulate pollution that uh, can affect lungs. Um, and those sort of become comorbidities uh, for uh, COVID-19. Oh, interesting. So we've seen a higher incidence of people that live in areas where air pollution is high um, also suffer from the consequences of COVID-19 more so than people who live in communities that have cleaner air. Hmm. So certainly those, the, the direct burning of fossil fuels um, has a direct connection to COVID-19. Um, but uh, in, in what we see here in the, in the image that you are sharing is this notion of what can we learn from COVID, the, from the whole pandemic and our response to COVID-19 to how we should approach um, the whole question of climate change. Um, and so if you remember back in March and April when we were talking about the need for the lockdown and for sheltering in place and so forth, the argument that was made a lot was for flattening the curve, mm -hmm. right? And this was not that it was going to magically get rid of the virus, but that it was going to keep the rate of infections low enough that our hospital capacity was not overwhelmed. And so you'll see that that one graph that shows you what would have happened if you had taken no action in terms of the number of deaths and the number of hospitalizations versus if you did the lockdown, the sheltering in place, the social distancing and so forth, what that can do to flattening the curve. So the other big curve that we have to talk about is sort of what we call the hockey stick curve, which is the curve of the increasing greenhouse gases. And so you can kind of see that this is a curve that looks like a hockey stick, right? Because it sort of is curved at the bottom and then it sort of goes straight up starting at around um, the 1800s when we first started using coal and then started to use um, oil and then more recently in the last 60 years or so natural gas you know all three of which are fossil fuels and today uh, so from the pre-industrial levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere which would have been under 280 parts per million um, today um, that you know and this has data from july 5th so just earlier this month uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are 415 parts per million and now that, we that don't change has been so recent in the last, you yes, know, correct. less than 100 correct. years. Correct. Less than 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, and what we don't know is when do we pass the tipping point of unacceptable concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Um, and there's a significant debate about what that number should be. Um, you know, whether we should go back to pre-industrial levels, whether we should go back somewhere in between. Um, to like 350 parts per million, but certainly the trajectory we are on currently is not tenable, mm -hmm. right? So, um, um, which is why if you, um, if you look at what the fossil fuel industry says in terms of the amount of available fossil fuels that if we decided that we wanted to burn them, that is, it would, it would put the whole question of, like we cannot burn everything that they have the, access to because it would just make the whole climate question irrelevant right okay. because i mean climate will have changed and we, we we would not be having this debate anymore you can't go back <laughs> we cannot go back correct so unlike the pandemic which is temporary mm -hmm. right it may feel like a long long time while we are living through it but it is reversible because we will, there are both human practices and behaviors that we can temporarily adopt. And long-term we will have a vaccine, we will have other kinds of medicines that will help us to, to be able to live with the pandemic. Um, the consequences of not flattening the carbon emissions curve will not be something that we can go back for. We cannot develop a vaccine for it. Uh, we cannot develop medicines um, to address the consequences of 
the changes in climate. Um, you know, sea level rise, increased heat waves, um, uh, changes in agricultural productivity, uh, increased intensity of storms, uh, you know, depending on uh, increased fires. Um, those are kinds of things that are not going to be easily reversible. So one of the lessons that we have to think about is how can we come together as a global society to flatten this particular curve? That's a uh, really good comparison. And we managed mostly, mostly to do it right. when we started with the pandemic and we're still working right. on keeping that flat. But right. you're saying that the climate change curve we haven't even begun to address how we flatten it and how we can make permanent changes to keep it flat. Correct. Yeah, Correct. wow. And the thing is we have all the answers. Mm -hmm. It's not about not having the solutions at hand. So, so, the, so the opposite of, the, of, the, of um, COVID-19 is that unlike for COVID-19 where we are still trying to figure out, do we have a vaccine, which drugs work, right? Um, we already have the answers for what it is that needs to be done to flatten this curve. The climate right? curve. The climate curve, exactly. The, the greenhouse emissions curve. So we mm -hmm. already have the answers at hand. Mm -hmm. So the question is just about implementing those, uh, yeah. those solutions. Okay. Yeah. What a great comparison, though. I really like that. Um, so moving on to another topic, let's talk a little bit about the link between this pandemic and the environment in terms of... Um, how we're treating the planet and what factors that we've created that have led to um, more possibilities of pandemics. There's a term called zoonotics. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about that? And yes. I will share a screen to help you. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, so uh, zoonotic, uh, uh, so basically zoonoses are diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans. So these are diseases that originate in animals. Um, they, might have they might in some cases be diseases that animals have learned to live with um, because they have evolved with those particular viruses or bacteria or whichever other pathogen. And therefore they are fairly benign for the animal species in which they reside. Uh, but um, sometimes those diseases can jump species um, and then they can create havoc in the new species into which they jump um, because that new species does not have any immunity against that sort of given disease. So uh, zoonotic diseases are really any disease that sort of makes this jump from one species to another. Now, from the human health point of view, we are really concerned about the diseases that jump from other animals to us but we also have to recognize that our behaviors can also cause diseases to go the other way. That and so what are some of those behaviors that we're doing? Uh, okay, so, um, so of the, the various behaviors that we are doing uh, that kind of uh, can cause these diseases to jump one way or another is one is any kind of land use change. You know, deforestation is one of those sort of obvious kinds of land use changes. And locally close to home, uh, sort of forest fragmentation in North America, for example, has increased the risk of our exposure to Lyme disease. So, you know, just in case we think that these are just problems that happen in some other country on, you know, in some other part of the world, mm -hmm. uh, changes that we have made in our own landscapes around here also will affect us. And so uh, deforestation and other kind of land use changes um, has increased incidence of malaria in the Amazon, as an example has increased incidence of Lyme disease uh, here in the United States um, because of these changes in land use. That's interesting that you brought it so close to home with Lyme disease. And I'm also thinking of the West Nile virus yes. and Zika. And those are things that hit much closer to home in recent years here. So yes. those are caused by our environmental uh, Right. And some problem. of them, yes. And some of them are also caused by, uh, by just by people moving. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, this is how, uh, you know, the virus, uh, the current virus that we are d dealing with, SARS-CoV-2, has moved around, right? So wherever it might have originally originated, right, it has moved around because it moved with the people who moved it. The people carry it, yes. And people carry it. Right. And so, and so the, the changes in any given area might, might bring that particular pathogen out of the wilds of that area, 
but then other changes that we make, including moving the virus around and stuff like that, um, can also transmit it. Interesting. Um, you probably have heard that there is some concern that there is another sort of pandemic potentially looming. I did uh, hear that. Right, <laughs> uh, slime flu. Um, and so increased agricultural activity um, and intensified agricultural activity, um, that is sort of, um, uh, can also lead to these sort of zoonotic diseases. So, um, so H1N1, which is an avian flu, mm -hmm. um, and then swine flu, and then uh, the Nipah virus, uh, which you might have heard about. It was uh, primarily in uh, Malaysia and was associated with pig farming practices. Um, so there are a variety of other sort of uh, pathogens and zoonotic diseases that are then connected to agricultural practices. Um, then, you know, we hear a lot about the sort of the antibiotic resistance, you know, which currently in the COVID climate is something that we are concerned about. Um, because, um, uh, you know, people are developing secondary infections um, and, um, you know, you know, everybody's told to wash their hands, which is a very good idea, but um, to use antimicrobial everything is going to perhaps increase antibiotic resistance because most uh, my, uh, antimicrobial products are usually antibacterial mm -hmm. and not necessarily antiviral. And so, you know, excessive use of these antibacterial products is really not protecting you from SARS-CoV-2, but it could re result in increased um, sort of antibiotic yeah. resistance. Yeah, interesting. Um, you remember reading in the news in the last couple of years that, um, you know, a lot of elementary schools <laughs> require that students bring in as part of their school supplies um, soap pumps because the school districts just can't afford to have, unfortunately right. can't, they need their students to bring them in. But I remember they shifted and recommended that the parents do not send in the antimicrobial right. hand soap. Right. They wanted the basic hand soap. The basic hand soap. It cleans, right. as, we, as we learned with COVID-19, they said right. a bar of soap on your hands right. for 20 seconds of good washing is all right. you need. So, right. The, yeah. I mean, the SARS-CoV-2 seems to be pretty susceptible to just standard detergents and mm -hmm. like washing. We don't yeah. need the antimicrobials and that can sort of increase the sort of risk of, uh, you know, zoonotic diseases. Right. So, right. So that is certainly something to be, you know, to pay attention to. Yeah. And it uh, also makes us think a little bit about um, kind of global policy of environment, environmental policy on a global scale, right? We need to, uh, you know, we can make little changes in Illinois or in the United States, but right. we need to be part of the global community looking at these issues because Absolutely. all Absolutely. of the choices we make affect everyone. Absolutely. And, and as you have probably already heard that we think, well, we, we are pretty confident that SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that originated in bats. We don't yet know, we haven't yet solved the mystery of how it jumped from bats to humans, mm -hmm. whether there was an intermediate animal involved as there was for the SARS-CoV-1 uh, or whether it, um, it, it was just a bat to human transmission, which is also possible. Mm -hmm. um, but then we have to consider, so some of that exposure to bats could have been because of changes in habitat. Some of that exposure could have been because of wildlife trafficking and wildlife trade. Um, so there are all of these, and, and many of these things uh, require, as you say, global agreements, mm -hmm. right? In terms of the transportation, in terms of wildlife trafficking, um, in terms of, um, you know, climate change, um, all of these things, these are global problems that are contributing to zoonotic diseases and therefore they are going to require global solutions. Shamali, who are the major international organizations that are addressing environmental issues around the world that would be the ones that kind of lead this global um, discussion in, of, towards change? Who are those organizations? Um, you know, it's a good question. And it's, uh, it's a complicated question. Complicated because it really depends on what aspect that you are looking at. Increasingly, people are sort of generally realizing that you cannot be just focused on one thing narrowly. So if you think about an organization like the World Wildlife Fund, which probably most of us are pretty aware, with, mm -hmm. aware of, 
And World Wildlife Fund, historically, as the name suggests, you know, started out as a as an organization that was really concerned about the welfare of wildlife. And, panda bears. <laughs> and panda bears, exactly, and elephants and whatever else. And certainly those things are also still continuing to be of concern to them. But most organizations uh, are realizing that you can't just focus on the one thing without considering all of the things that it is tied to. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you, if you look up any organization, you know, take your pick, look at World Wildlife Fund as an example, look at any of the United Nations organizations, the United Nations, uh, um, you know, organization that's focused on nature. Um, uh, or even if you look at UNICEF, or if you look at any of these organizations, both the NGOs, um, the sort of international um, sort of uh, global organizations, even local organizations, everybody is sort of seeing the intersectionality between all of these um, issues, if you will, that they, they don't exist independently. And so when we are really talking about sustainability, we have to sort of think about not just the one thing, but we have to think about how all of these things intersect with each other. I'm sharing a screen that you provided me that I think sums up what you said really well. It's yes. such, it's such a um, the, the interrelationship between all aspects are so right. important. Right, and I think I think people often sort of assume that somehow you know if you are a tree hugger and you really care deeply about the environmental things, what you're really asking is that people should give up something, um, whatever that thing is, right, mm -hmm. of the moment. Um, but I think the reality is that when you think about what sustainable development means, and sustainability simply means, you know, using resources today in a way that allows them to be available for future generations. So mm -hmm. we have to always imagine, if you will, that we are, we didn't inherit the planet from our ancestors but we are borrowing it from the future and, oh, and so I love if, that. that's, if that's the mindset that you operate under then you can sort of see that it is your responsibility um, to to take care of the planet mm -hmm. and so when we are thinking about getting to a planet that is sort of fair and just for everybody that provides for economic well-being that provides for environmental well-being of our own species, of other species, we have to kind of think about how all of those things um, kind of work together. Wow. Because I it is really about, you know, maintaining society, maintaining economy, and maintaining ecology. Yeah, and finding a balance that works for all of those areas. Correct. Right, Correct. great. Yeah, Correct. you couldn't have stated it better. Thank you so much. Oh, um, cool. Before we end, is there anything else about COVID-19 or the environment that you would like to mention? I, did we forget anything? Um, no, I, I, don't, I think, I mean, I, I really think that, you know, the, the, I, I sort of, in, in some ways, you know, living through the pandemic is very unnerving, very unsettling. Um, but I think it is also an opportunity to really rethink our relationship with each other as well as with the planet. Because I think uh, more than anything else, it is bringing to light the reality that this is not a problem that you and I can solve individually, mm -hmm. uh, but that this is a challenge that we all have to um, sort of approach collectively. Yeah. And I think um, the most, I, I mean, I don't know if there's a most important lesson, but really something that has sort of been brought to light is that the pandemic is going to perhaps serve as a testing board for our ability to work collectively. Yeah, you've seen everything has stopped so abruptly that when we start to restart, we can make changes that are more drastic than you would do normally because normally, you're exactly. starting from nothing and moving yes. forward. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, we are, uh, there's going to be a new normal, right? Like going back to normal doesn't mean going back to what things were like in January of 2020. Seems so long ago. <laughs> it seems so long ago, right. We were and, complaining about the snow. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And, um, and that's not maybe where we even want to go to. Yeah. Right. So what will January of 2021 look like? Right. right. And how how can it be different in a better way 
than January of 2021. Great, great point. So thank you so much, Emily. This has been so informative. I'm glad that we got this to chat. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to your one of your courses that you're teaching in the fall. Yeah. It's called Seed, Soil, and the Soul. It's a yeah. learning community. So you team teach it with uh, Deborah Edelman of the English department. Yeah. Uh, and so it's environmental biology and film. And yes, and film and, studies, yeah. And I, it sounds like a fascinating way to learn about the environment through film and to learn about film focusing on the environment. So any yes. students out there interested, register for Seed Soils in the Soul this fall at COD. Yes, thank you. Thanks, and stay well. Thank you for joining me. And until I see you next, continue to wear your mask. Yes, <laughs> thank you. All right, thanks, Shamaline. Yeah.